Welcome to Christian Assembly of Schriever, a full gospel Bible believing church. We are people who love God, who worship Him and praise Him. Please join us now for a great word that the Lord has for us today. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Awesome. Awesome. Amen. Well, this is the month of October. Yes, we're almost through October. We're getting into November. Uh, but hey, wait, there's one more storm. Another <laughs> yeah. storm coming. <clears throat> Amen. But October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So don't sit down, Daddy. Don't sit down. You have to get right back up. So you and Mom, come on up. Pastor Troy, you come on up. Your wife's already up here. We want to recognize our pastors. Let's uh, acknowledge God and uh, let's thank him because he is the one to be thankful for. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning.
know him? Oh, come on. It's not a trick question. How does someone get to know Jesus? How do they hear about him? Through us. Amen. As a witness. We're to go and tell others about him. How else can they hear? Except someone be sent. And that's not just the pastors. Oh. I'm going to let you step on the toes. All right. All right.
imagine him coming, walking on the water? Woo, amen. I think I would have bowed down in the boat too. I don't know if I'd have been like Peter though. Let me walk on the water, I don't know. I mean, think about it. Would you really have asked, let me walk on the water? <laughs> in a hurry. Some may have, some may have. It depends, you know? So, but uh, man, just to imagine just seeing Jesus coming. Here comes the King. Really? Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever imagined it? Here comes the King. All bow down. Amen. He is holy.
Israelites in the desert just wandering around aimlessly. But Father, when we see you coming, Jesus, when we see you coming, we know you are our Savior. You are our Lord. You are our Father. For you are Yahweh.
praise grow, Jesus. Cleanse us, Lord. Awesome song. 
Amen. Which actually presents an opener for today. You know, God said that he's going to pour out the flood, but how many are willing to jump in the water? Yes. Brother Tommy mentioned Brother Peter a while ago, you know, how many people are even daring to get out of the boat? Come on. Where's the boat? A comfortable place during this 2020 storm. <clears throat> Amen. Do you love the Lord? Yeah. See, when God pours out his spirit, it's not for nothing. Amen. It's not for just to pour out his spirit. Amen. I'm going to preach to you today. This is going to be actually now part two of a, of a part three message. <laughs> it's growing. Um, and today I'm going to present the gospel to you. And my first scripture is going to take is, is Matthew chapter 15. You can hold your place there. As we were worshiping today, <clears throat> God spoke to my heart and said that, and I don't know if it's for some of you or for all of us, but it's time to have a Garden of Gethsemane experience today. A Garden of Gethsemane experience today. Amen. Amen. When Jesus Christ went into the garden, the Son of God himself, amen, what did he do? He went there to pray and to hear the voice of God, but he also went there to petition the Father that uh, for, the, for the, the thing that God had called him to do was now come nigh, and it was time for him to give his life, amen, to fulfill what God had called him to do, amen. And as he was praying, what did he pray? Father, take this cup from me. Let it pass from me. If there be any other way, amen, take this cup from me, amen. Jesus had a struggle going on here. We don't understand the fullness of it unless we would have been there. But it gives a depiction of what God is calling the church to today, which is what did Jesus pray after he prayed those prayers? Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You see, God has a will for all of us. And whether we like it or not, he wants us to fulfill that will that he's called us to do. Amen. Now is not the time to back up on what God has called us to do. Now it's time to drive in hard from what he's called us to do. Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says when he does, what is he going to find his servants doing? Amen. Are we going to be serving? Are we like Peter, at least trying to get into the water and trying to get into the will of God? Or are we going to be safely in the boat where it's nice and safe? Amen. But listen to some messages this week, just about every one of them talk about taking the risk of faith. David Jeremiah says, there, without, there is no faith without fear. What he meant was, if you're going to have faith, there's going to be some fearful times because God's going to call us to take risks. Because taking faith is to take a risk of faith. To step out of the boat and to believe and trust God. Amen. But, how's it go? No pain, no gain. Uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Um, the church has been playing it safe for so many years now. It's time to take a risk of faith. Amen. It's time to surrender to the will of God yes. and not our will. Yes. Amen. Amen. But Tommy said this morning, just a while ago, unless the world hears it from the church, how is the world going to know anything about salvation? <laughs> Amen. It's time to get out of the boat and start walking on the water. Because you can. How can you? Because he gives us the power to do that. Amen. It's when Peter started looking at the waves that he said, I can't do this. And he began to drown. Amen. The moment we begin to walk this walk and try to walk this walk under our own power, we will sink. But as we trust God, God will give us the ability to do great, crazy things. Amen. Walking on water. Amen. How heavy is water? How heavy is you? You is heavier than water. Amen. But God made that way. What he made was the way that was impossible. He made it possible. Amen. God is calling the church to do some impossible things in this day and time. You all ready for this other storm? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something. 2020 ain't over yet. Yeah. Right. Amen. And the other storm is already brewing called the election day. Amen. We might as well prepare ourselves and pray and get ready. Gear up for the battle now. If you know the battle's coming, why wait until it comes? Let's go. Let's go meet the battle. Amen. In Jesus' name and take authority over some things. Do you love the Lord? Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. 
and we give you praise for this time and your word have your way speak to our hearts father god in jesus name we pray and everybody said Amen. now the ultimate title of this sermon this three now three-part sermon is little is much when god gets in it little is much last week we talked about the body of christ as a whole we talked about this year 2020 the holy spirit is sounding the alarm for the church to awaken from a deep spiritual sleep and he's calling us to repent and become doers of God's word and fulfilling the great commission and making disciples of Christ. What does the Bible say about being doers of the word? And not hearers only. Amen. Deceiving our own selves. That means we can know the word, we can hear the word, we can learn the word, we can memorize. You can memorize scriptures all you want to, but unless you put that oar in the water, it ain't going to get nowhere. We got to do something with what we hear. And then God is not called to be full of knowledge. He's called to be full of knowledge so we can do something with the knowledge that he gives. Amen. Some people kind of wonder, probably wonder why God has stopped talking to them. Because maybe we're not doing with nothing what he's already said to do. It's time to stop praying about things that God has already told us to do. You know, we spend a lot of times doing that. Go feed the hungry. I got to pray about that. Go minister to ones in prison. I got to pray about it. The Lord said already do it, church. He says, go out and win the loss. Well, I got to pray about it. You ain't got to pray about nothing. The only thing you got to pray about is when you got to get up and go. Amen. You know, that song, Blessed Assurance, it's not a, it's not a barker lounger that song is about. Blessed assurance, this chair is mine. I am so comfy all of the time. We think serving Jesus is about being comfortable. Amen. It is so not. Listen, I know that God has something great for the church. If it's not the rapture, then I wonder what it is. You ever think about that this year? If it ain't the rapture, then what is it? But I know one thing, you better be ready for both, either or. Amen. And there's so many of the church who are not. You know, just like we talked about last week, even, while, even though they saw Jesus and even though they worshiped Jesus, some still doubted. Amen. There are so many who worship Jesus and they know who Jesus is, but they don't take any steps of faith outward to do anything for God at all. Listen, what we're going to talk about this morning, doing the will of God is not about singing. It's not about prophesying. It's not about preaching. It's not about teaching. It's being what God has called you to do as a child of the living God, doing the will of the Lord. Because if we don't do that, we can't do what he's called us to do. Amen. You love the Lord. God is good. 2020, strange year. What's God doing? He's awakening us, awakening us as the body of Christ to repent from the sin of omission. We're going to continue that today. From failing and fulfilling the Great Commission. Because we have fallen into a spiritual slumber with our eyes closed to the vision for winning souls. Those who are lost. Our eyes have been closed for reaching to our communities. We have become out of focus as the body of Christ and what God desires due to becoming too self-focused as the church on what we want. Now, I was listening to David Jeremiah this week, and he was talking about the church of Laodicea, and he titled that message, The Disgusting Church. The Disgusting Church. Because they did everything right on the outside. But the Bible said they didn't know they were poor, pitiful, wretched, blind, and naked, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He said, you think you're rich because you got things on the outside going on, but you, you ain't got nothing going on on the inside. They were lukewarm. And I learned something about that message is that when it talks about the hot or cold, <laughs> you know, it talks about the, the, the cisterns of water or the waterways that would come through there. You know, the cold water had a productive part to it, too. I thought it was cold doing nothing. No, it had a purpose. There are two sides. Either pick a side. You're either going to be hot or you're going to be cold, but at least both of those are productive. Being lukewarm is not productive. And man, being lukewarm is staying in the boat while the world is going to hell or staying within the walls of the church while the world is going to hell and keeping our mouths shut out there. It's one thing to open our mouths in here. Do we sing it just as loud out there? Or Brother Charles, somebody's going to lock me up. I'll come visit you. I got a key. Do you love the Lord? 2020. 
is no accident. 2020 has a purpose. Amen. God ain't going to allow all this without bringing all that. And if it ain't the rapture, I wonder what it is. Church, are you ready for whatever? God is good. You see, the terms that we've used in, 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 the, in the past and, and even today, the terms body of Christ and the term the church used to mean the same thing. It's still supposed to mean the same thing. But the, the term the body of Christ is used less and less, and there's so much focus on church and how well and, and going to college and hiring people to come tell us in our church how to make better church. You know how you make better church? Be a better Christian. Amen. Be on your face before God in prayer. Be obedient to what God called you to do as a child of God. And then we can fulfill what he's called us to do as a body of ministry. You see, last Sunday, in part one of this message was mostly focused on the body of Christ as a whole. But today, I'm going to talk about you and me. To focus more on the members of the body of Christ, the individual Christian. Listen, the Holy Spirit, say it with me, Holy Spirit. Who is calling us to hear the alarm he is sounding in Zion? Where is Zion? Not in the world. In church. God is sounding an alarm in church. Why does God have to sound the alarm in church? Because <clears throat> we are falling asleep in all of our wonderfulness. Again, it's like our Brother David Jeremiah said this week, you know, in the scripture where it talks about the church of Laodicea, and it says in that scripture where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would hear it, come and open up to me. He said, That's good that people use it as an evangelistic tool, but he said, No, he was talking to that church. You know what that meant? If Jesus was at the door knocking, that means he was outside of the church. And he was calling the church, Let me back in. You've asked me to leave. You ever been in somebody's house <laughs> and, they, and, and, and they acknowledge everybody in the house but you? But you've been invited? What do you do? I start scooting toward the door. You give me an invitation, but when I get there, you don't want to talk to me? You don't want to give me no coffee? You don't want to give me no Crippa Cream donut? When they're sitting right there on the table? You pull to be the host? And you're going to hear, boom. The problem is, the church ain't heard the door slam shut. And Jesus is outside knocking. I stand at the door and knock. Behold, if anyone would come into me, because there's a great side to that, to that message of Laodicea. He still gives an invitation that if anybody would open up to him, he'd begin to bless again and make it from the disgusting church to an effective powerhouse church. Because God wants to do that. He doesn't want to see no church fall. He doesn't, see, he doesn't want to see the church fail. He wants to see us successful. And we are successful when we're fulfilling what he's called us to do. But we can't do that if we are not sound. How many of you worked on this church as a physical building? How many of you ever worked on a building? But let's look at this one specifically. What holds this place together? The sheetrock? The outside wall, what holds it together? The skeleton. The beams, huh? Fastened to the foundation. The girders or whatever you want to call them. I'm not professional with that. You take all that away, what happens to the building? It'll fall. For the Packy is one of the cutest stories. Hey Amen. If he's watching TV, I hope he sees this because Packy, love you, man. He had built a porch in front of his house one day. And he was so proud of his porch. And he's standing there and drinking his coffee in his front yard. And Keith, his neighbor, Keith Dufresne, came over. And everybody's looking at his new porch, how wonderful this porch looked. And then a breeze came, a little breeze, just whew, And the porch went poof. Keith said, did you put supports? Peggy said, put what? Without the supports, what happened to this beautiful porch? With just a barely, barely a win. Amen. It was so cute. Amen. 
So he got somebody else to finish building their farm. Amen. But what happens if the church has no support? This, the building itself is, is, is structured together just right so it does not collapse. And it has withstood the storms that have passed because it's well built. Amen. Each and every one of us are a part of the structure of this building, so to speak. We play a part in it. And if there's one area that's weak, the integrity of the church is compromised. You see, if we... What's that? You're only as strong as your weakest link. The church is only as strong as its weakest link. Don't be that weakest link. You see, because we are called to live righteously. And those who live righteously, those who live up circumspect before God, those who stay faithful to God, even when nobody is looking, is how God builds a church on those foundations. You see, the church nowadays, though, wants to entertain folks, ha, to draw the folks, amen, but when a, but when a little wind comes, whew, it don't stand. Why? Because there's no foundation. Listen, we are the structure, the physical structure of the church, each and every one of us, and we all matter. You ever seen somebody walk with, with a little toe missing? Come on. It's got the, the, the walk is changed, and how the balance is changed. Go find somebody without a, without a little toe. Anybody here got a little Or a big toe. See what happens. Amen? It limps. It walks funny. Even the littlest thing matters. Stop believing what Satan says about you. You might be insignificant in the eyes of the world. You might be insignificant in your own eyes. But little is much when God gets in it. You see, when God gets into us, he does some great and mighty things if we'll just let him. If we don't back up, we got to go forward. we got to push on. we got to get this thing done before Jesus comes back. we got too many empty chairs up for her. Do you love the Lord? Talking about us today. God is sounding an alarm for us to fulfill what he's called us to do. Listen, now, before we were saved, we committed sins out of a heart that desired the things of the world. How I many of you have been there? But as Christians, a lot of Christians, if not most, of the sins we commit are sins of omission. Because you know, we want people to think we're good and we're standing with God. Well, I don't go to the bars no more. I don't smoke dope. I don't drink. I don't do this. Blah, 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 blah. Amen. I'm glad you don't do those things anymore. But what have you done lately? You see, we get, we get in trouble when we come into the area of disobedience. And we come to the area of neglecting our salvation or in the area of failing to do what God has called us to do as Christians and as a vocation ministry-wise. We neglect to do that. God appointed us for reasons. He created you the way you are with a purpose. Amen. The way you look, the way you sound, the, are you with me? The way you walk, the way you talk. Amen. He's got everything about you chosen for an area of ministry that's going to help win somebody to Jesus. Do you love the Lord? But that's up to you what you do with it. The Lord doesn't force us to do anything. But if the heart is not circumspect, then the ministry won't be upright. We've got we to shift the focus and put what is first first. God is good, and all the time, say sins of omission. <laughs> you see, we, 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 the sins of omission are the things that we fail or neglect to do out of a heart that's supposed to be desirous from what he wants from us, but in reality from a heart that still wants to have its own way and not God's way. Listen, we can be doing a whole lot of things, even that's good, but what is our motive for doing it? God is a judger of the heart, not just when you do something wrong, but when you do something right. Do you love the Lord? Listen, we may say that we are sold out to God with our mouths, but our actions of inaction spells out who or what we are really sold out to. You want to find out what somebody is sold out to? Listen to the things they talk about. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
I have a question to anybody who feels they called to God but they never talk about anything about Jesus. Never say anything about the Lord. Never say any dreams that, that God has called them to. Yeah, I'm called of God, but they never talk about Jesus. Hey Amen. How many of you have ever been a football player? What did you talk about? Sports. How many of you have ever been a, a police officer? What do you talk about? Police officer things. How many of you have ever been married? What do you talk about? My husband, <laughs> my wife, my family, et cetera, et cetera. You talk about what is in your heart the most. Do you love the Lord? Matthew 15, 8 says, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In the, in the easy to read version, it says it like this. These people honor me with their words, but I'm really not important to them. Jesus is talking about here only those who practice religion, and he calls them hypocrites. Hmm. Listen, for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? If I know what God wants me to do as a Christian and I don't do it, I ain't talking about committing the sin of whatever. I'm talking about what we don't do. If I know that God has called me to witness to someone and I don't do it, I'm a hypocrite. I didn't say it. If I know to go witness to someone and God says it and is dealing with my heart to do it and I don't do it, I am a hypocrite. Because guaranteed next Sunday I'm going to be in church going, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. God said, I tried last week. Are you with me? To know to do good and don't do it is a, is a hypocrite. <laughs> And the Bible says that that person shall have no place in the kingdom of heaven. Can I meddle just a little bit? Listen, we've got to get to the, through the hard stuff before we get to the good stuff. Because there is some good stuff. How many of you are bosses in here? Is it always easy when you're a boss? Do you love the Lord? The Lord is talking to the church today. Why, why call them hypocrites? That's a little hard, Jesus. <laughs> because a hypocrite is a person who knows the word. They know what God would want them to do, but they don't do it. Either out of refusal to obey, which is an outright rebellion to God, or out of neglect to do it, which, God's, which God says to do. Listen, if, if, if we're j even if, we if we're saved and we're full of the Holy Ghost and we neglect to do, what are we telling God? God, you're not important enough for it to be in the forefront of my mind. Was that again? Mm. Oh, this is not easy today. It, Lord, you're not enough for me to be mindful to know what your word says, much less obey it. Listen, as individuals, when we sin, we don't affect just us. Don't ever fall into the lie that the devil tells you that you are insignificant in the body of Christ. God can never use me. God can never use me. Look at all the stuff that I struggle with. Look at all the, don't fall into that lie. God can never use me. Look at all my, all my faults. Look how fallible I am. My goodness, I don't feel like I'm a Christian sometimes. Have you ever been there? Don't fall into that lie. Each and every one of us in here are called to be used of God. Amen. And stop waiting until you get to that point of perfection or you will never be used. Amen. Because you ain't never going to be good enough. You just got to be ready enough. And I'm going to tell you, the time is now. <laughs> but if we neglect to do it for whatever reason, we're still neglecting to do what God's called us to do. Do you love the Lord? And, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. And the parable of the ones with the talents. The one that buried the talent, that had the one that buried with himself, I don't think he was malicious about it. I really think he thought he was doing something okay. I'm going to hold on to this, and when he comes back, I will have it. I'm going to protect it. I'm going to shove it way down in here. Nobody can find it or get it or steal it. And I'm going to give it back to him. He's going to be so proud of me when I do. And we think that when we get saved, I'm going to take this salvation of mine, and I'm going to keep it quietly down inside of my heart, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep it safe. And when Jesus comes back, 
When Jesus comes back, here it is. I'm going to give it to him. Amen. He's going to be so proud of me. Amen. Come on. Are you with me? Because there are some people who actually save, once saved, always saved, which is not true at all. Amen. And we hold on to the salvation and we don't produce anything besides that. Amen. That salvation he gives us is enough to be producers of fruit. And the Bible says God likes lots of He likes lots of fruit. The Bible says, bear ye much fruit wherein God is glorified. Amen. But that one, I don't believe he was malicious, but I believe he was ignorant. And what happened when the master came back is that he took from that which he had and gave it to one who did the most of what he, what he did with it. And that God was standing there saying, why did you take this talent from me? He said, I didn't give it to you to keep. I gave it to you to give away. The salvation that God has given us was not to keep for ourselves. It was to give away to somebody else. And we hoard it, and we build churches on it, and we're thinking we're doing something good because we have lots of church, or we have lots of people, or we have lots of this or lots of that. When God said, depart from me, I never knew you, workers of iniquity. I don't care that you cast out many devils in my name. I don't care that you laid hands on the sick and you recovered. Where were you, and what did you do with the salvation I gave you? Did you produce fruit otherwise? And he's going to take it from you, and you're not getting into heaven. What a horrible existence to be in hell, knowing I was once right with God. Missed it by that much. You need to wake up. Because it's not about having church. It's about being church. And what God has called us to do. Amen? Are you with me? You know, people are asking, <laughs> you know, I heard somebody say the other day, and it is true, you know, Satan's been trying to get us quiet, the church to be quiet all this time, and finally he's done it. I don't agree completely with that statement. I believe it's God that's got the church quiet. Because we've done some ridiculous things in the name of Jesus in the past several years. I mean, overall as a whole. Come on. I see things that don't matter one way or another to the kingdom of God, and we're filling our church services with it, and it doesn't mean a hill of beans. God ain't worried about how you can hit the ground. <laughs> I'm a metal now. I've been Pentecostal all my life, so I can do this. Because I saw it when it was real, I saw it when it was live, and I saw it when it was Memorex. I mean, remember that commercial? Is it live or is it Memorex? I'm seeing a lot of Memorex going on. Amen, where it's an imitation thing. <laughs> Listen, it ain't important how you hit the ground. It's important how you get up. And if you get up the same way you went down, I'm not being critical, I'm being real. And when all this COVID thing hit, none of that mattered anymore, doesn't it? You know what mattered? Prayer and seeking God and reaching out to others. That's the only thing that mattered. <gasps> Isn't that amazing? That's what God called us to do in the great... In the Great Commission, he's getting us quiet so we can wake up. I don't know about you, when it gets quiet in the house, I wake up. I got to have some noise when I sleep. I got to have the fan going on. Maybe a little something, something like a, my, I, got, I got some little sound effects I listen to before I go to sleep, like thunderstorms, psh, puts me to sleep. But I'm going to tell you, and with all that, if the electricity go out, boom, I'm up. That ceiling fan goes off, boom, I'm up. It gets too quiet, I'm awake. Maybe in the quietness, God is getting our attention, and he's talking to us. He's giving us the biggest altar call right now. Church, are we answering that? This might be a part four message. Do you love the Lord? Let's see, as we as individuals, when we sin, we may not affect only ourselves, and we don't but all who are connected with us in some way. But we surely affect our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when, en and when enough of us, listen, church, enough of us begin to neglect our salvation and our duties as Christians, we affect the whole lump. Galatians 5, 9 says, in the new, in the new international version, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. A little of it. One Bible commentary on the scripture states, a little sour leaven influences the whole mass 
or lump of dough. It makes it of the same nature with it, increasing to more ungodliness. You know, all this ungodliness we're seeing take place in the church today started somewhere and with someone. Just one. It takes one to walk into a church building and sound good and look good and smell good and sing good. Got the WWJD bracelet on. Got all that happening. Amen. And they totally not be from God at all. But if you can speak good enough, we're going to welcome him. They can sing good enough, we're going to welcome them. If they're going to do whatever good enough, we're going to welcome them. We'll give them the front row of the, of the, of the chair, of, of the pews, and we welcome them on in because they look good and they smell good. They must be good because look at the outside. Amen. And then we got the old crusty critter amen, that comes in and, and just, huh? Who can't sing, who can't play, who can't preach, who can't speak, who can't do anything. And do we spend the time of day? I had the preacher that went up to preach one day before he got there. You, you probably know the story I'm about to say. People come into church. There's, there's this old homeless man sitting in the front of the church, and nobody talked to him as he's coming in, sitting by the steps of the church, and nobody spoke a word to him. And as church was beginning to start, the pastor hadn't stepped up there yet, and here comes this crusty old dude that was sitting by the stairs, had the nerve to walk up to the pulpit, and when he took off the hat and jacket, it was the pastor. He said, guess what I'm preaching on today? <laughs> It's kind of where we are. It's kind of where we are, and it's really sad. Because we think we're looking and smelling good. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. Do we know where we are today? Listen to me. I'm almost not about to close. Let me give you a little more time. We started late. Listen. Now, this scripture about the leaven is specifically addressing false doctrine within the church. We know that. But listen, but if we withhold the gospel and neglect to spread the gospel and therefore neglect to make disciples of Christ, especially because we do not live out personally a solid and continuous foundational relationship with Christ, do we not then ourselves become guilty of perpetrating a false doctrine? Because we fail to become doers of God's word. Did you get it? If we fail to carry out the commands of God, it makes us just as guilty as the ones who outright refuse to follow God. Hmm. It's quiet. It's quiet. I don't know if I'm going to be pastor again after this. You might take, you might take envelopes back and... And I'll put another video up there and say, what? It's like Dwayne, time out. Hold up, Swola. Amen. See, therefore, what we neglect to do, which we know we should do, but do with it not, helps to increase to more ungodliness in our own lives, and we affect our churches that way and those around us. And boy, if there's anything the world needs today, it's an effectual church. I ain't talking one of those how to put on a good program. I'm talking about one where people show up because Jesus is there. Please don't come here to see Brother Troy. Oh, you're missing it. Or brother or sister, anybody. Come here to see Jesus. And if you can't see Jesus here, please tell me. We'll invite him in. Either that or you're just blind as a bat. Because <laughs> Jesus is here. I believe that. I believe the Lord has been in this place. Amen. But even the children in the house need some encouragement and correction. Listen, now I'm going to get really nitty-gritty with you in the time we have left. More specifically about the sins of omission. Are you ready? When we neglect to pray daily or without ceasing, we are not interceding, therefore, for others. So therefore, they are not receiving what they might need from God. But also, we, neither do we gain strength, and we lack what we need from God because we are not entering into the presence of God. So therefore, what happens to the anointing of God upon our lives? Listen, I pray in my car. I can sing loud in my car. 
Nobody hears me. I'm on the top of my lungs. I turn to Lorne L. Harris. I turn to Dallas Home. I turn into the Imperials. I turn into, you know, whoever, Leon Patilla. I can just sing away. Amen. But there comes a time I got to shut my car off and get on my face before Jesus in my prayer closet and get into some serious prayer time with God. It has to happen. Prayer is one of the most neglected things in the house of God. And God clearly says, I want my house to be a house of prayer. Prayer is what makes a difference. Prayer is what unlocks God's power. Prayer is where we find God's presence. Prayer is where we make that personal connection with God. The Bible says, draw an eye unto God, and God will what? Draw an eye unto you. It's where the, it's where the blessings fall. It's where the fire comes. It's where the change happens. You see, when every time we go into their prayer closet, the Bible says, shut the door behind you. What does that mean? No distractions. Shut the door behind you and get down your face before God and talk about you and Jesus. Dwayne's boots are not in my closet. His pants don't hang on my hangers. His shirts don't hang on my hangers. What hangs on my hangers? Troy's stuff. Troy's boots. Troy's shoes. Troy's whatevers are in that prayer closet. I got to spend time with God praying for me. If I don't take care of this house, I won't better help take care of your house. Amen. And that's what the places we're failing. We're not getting on our faces before God and seeking the Lord. We're not practicing 2 Chronicles 7, 14. For if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, and seek my face. Seeking is not a five-minute interval of calling upon the Lord. It's seeking. It's searching for him in prayer. Searching for him in my life. What does it mean to search? God is not lost. <laughs> It means to go after him with a fervor, amen, and chase after God, amen. Who is it wrote the, the, the book God Chasers? Tom, Tommy Tanny wrote God Chasers, an awesome book about how you just get after with a fervor and a passion for God. Where is the passion for God? Where has it gone? Oh, I hope you're quiet because you're just listening and thinking. I'm going to tell you. That's coming soon is going to sound a trumpet. And Lord's going to open them books. And we're going to give an account for what we have done with this salvation. But if we neglect his word daily, let me get on this stuff. I'm going to start closing. Sister Debbie, you can even, you know, this will be a for Can I get on it? to study God's word how often every day I'm a metal up in your business now those little plastic loaves of bread you got on your table when you pick one of those scripture a day that's cute there are so many people that memorize scriptures that have no clue what it means that's not where the authority comes in the authority comes in in knowing. The Bible says faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing comes by what? The word of God. If you study the word hearing and you look up the meaning in Hebrew or whatever, that word hearing means understanding. Faith comes by understanding. And understanding comes by the word of God. If there's no Bible study and you don't understand what the word of God says, then when you use it against the devil, he's going to laugh at you because you're misquoting scripture. Uh, in Pentecostals and churches especially, I've heard this scripture used a lot of times. As God said one time, he said, well, I didn't go pray for him because, you know, the Bible says lay hands on no man suddenly. So I didn't go lay hands on him. I didn't pray for him. And I looked at him like he didn't, then lost his bowl of cornflakes. Because that is not what that means. What do you mean you didn't go pray for him? The Bible says when you pray for him, lay hands on them and pray. That scripture he was talking about means this. Don't select a novice to step up to do the Lord's work where it takes an experienced person. That's what that scripture means. You see, but we spend so much time memorizing scripture because somebody tells you, you got to memorize it. Boo, you got to know what it says. 
Look, GPS had me going five different ways to Sister Kathy and Charlie's house yesterday. After I got one point of Chang Bay, had me going across Gilligan's Island. I don't know what was happening. Hey, man, it, it said make a U-turn, then it said go straight. Now, how can I make a U-turn if... So I had to rely on my understanding of how to get there before I got there. And that's how I got there. By understanding where I was going before I got on the road. Amen? Are you, are you with me? If we don't spend time in daily Bible study, I'm glad you know how to quote it, but do you know what it says? So you can live it. Can I jump on this one? I'm almost finished. How many give me five more minutes? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Now, I'm going to hide behind the pulpit when I say this one. When we neglect going to church, we're sinning. Ooh, that's not a popular one anymore. What does the Bible say? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves as the manner of some is, even more so as you see the day. What day? The day of the Lord approaching. Do we see that approaching? Yes. Now, let me give you a disclaimer. COVID has happened. They told us to stay out of church. We're trying to figure this thing out. But I'm talking about before COVID even showed up. And what we're going to do after it's all said and done. You've got to be in the house of God in order to grow. How do y'all know that? I'm going to give you some scripture that tells you so. Listen, in 1 John 1, 7, it says... But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The New Life Version says it like this. If we live in the light as he is in the light, we share what we have in God with each other. It is purpose that we have fellowship. Because if you don't have fellowship, you cannot grow properly in the Lord. Because God is expecting us to grow up spiritually, amen, so that we can be effectual in the church. How in the world can we say we love God when we don't want to go to church? Listen, me and my wife have been married 34 years. And I guarantee you, when I first saw her, Ain't nobody, I didn't need no scripture to go figure out to go to her house. I knew to go to her house without even reading the Bible. Because I was in love. And there ain't nothing going to stop me from her front door. Are you with me? We even eloped. Because I knew, and I'm going to preach, because I knew she was the one that God had. And I was in love with and nothing. Nothing going to stop me now. Because I love that woman. You love something, ain't nothing going to keep you from it. I know people start backsliding when they start staying out of church. That's the first step. And if you fish on Sunday, I'm going to pray that God will not let the fish bite. <laughs> Catching little, little baby croakers all day long. Get a sunburn for nothing. If you go out to church, that's fine. Yeah. Because that's part, of, that's part of the Sabbath. It's fishing. Remember the ox thing on the Sabbath? Let's not get carried away. But where was Jesus on the Sabbath day? Oh, I want to be like Jesus. Oh, I can't make it that day. People so many want to be like Jesus, but they don't want to be like Jesus. They say they want to be like Jesus, but they're not acting like Jesus. They're acting like the Antichrist. <laughs> Listen. If we're not fellowshipping, how can we draw from each other? This iron sharpeneth iron then becomes a moot statement. I need my iron sharpened sometimes. You know why? Because I get a little dull. You know when we get dull? When we stay out of church. Well, I can, I can watch Tiggs and I can watch Joe Lowstein. Well, call on them when you get sick. Give them your phone number. I don't Oh, I'm, I'm all up in it now. I might as well finish jumping up in there. Listen, this, that iron sharpened with iron rule, we stay clean and sharp for God to use us to fulfill the gospel as we draw strength and encouragement and resources and love and grace from one another. 
as we fellowship with one another in church, we become accountable to one another, which helps us to remain accountable and clean before God. If I can't submit myself to my brother, I guarantee you I'm not submitting myself to God. Didn't the Bible say, if you don't love your brother who you can see? How can you love God who you can't see? And if you want to hang out with your brother that you can see, you ain't hanging out with God. I don't care what you say. And that is not the place we need to be. And the Bible said even more so as we see the day approaching. Do we see the day approaching? We should be scared not to be in church. I bet the rapture is going to happen on Sunday morning. Wouldn't that be crazy? <laughs> huh? And the only way to find out is because Sister Janice didn't put the bullets down next month. Where's she at? <laughs> Listen. In the meantime, with everything that's going on, even if we're at home with the COVID stuff, we still make phone calls. We can still text. We can, there's no reason to not have communication in this day and time. I'm almost done. I, I need to be done. I'm going to go ahead and stop right here. Thank you. We're committed to sin of omission. Also, when we don't trust God and put our faith in Him. When we don't love our neighbor as ourself. We don't love God with all our heart and all our soul and our mind. When we have no desire to become actively involved in any part of winning souls to Christ and make disciples. When we don't know what God wants us to do, or we do know, and then we don't do it. And can I tell you, I'm going to close right here. God does not accept ignorance as an excuse. There's no reason for us not knowing the will of God and for not knowing the word of God and for not fulfilling what he's called us to do. You know, the Bible talks about when Jesus addresses this issue and he welcomes the good and the faithful in. And he said, because when you, you saw me naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was... In prison, you visited me. And what the disciples say, the good ones who are going to heaven, when did we see you? He said, as you've done it unto one of them, you do as unto me. But the ones that were on the left side, after he divided the sheep from the goats, and said, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. And those on the left, the goats, what did he do? He cast them out into eternal fire. They went to hell. All in church. But so many are so busy. The disgusting church is so busy about being the church or, or having church and having more church and are excited in church. We're not excited Sunday afternoon or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. We lose our zeal. After the church is over, after the doors are closed, that's as far as we get in our spirituality. And we wonder why Satan always has the upper hand. For a true faithful child of God, the devil cannot get the upper hand. Will you stand with me today? This is the end of part two, three, two, going to be three. I'm scared. I am like scared in these days and times. You know what I'm afraid of? When I look on Facebook, even maybe some in here, and some in other churches, there seem to be people just oblivious to what's really going on. Listen. Was you just said this morning, can you imagine going to heaven? Anybody ever think about that? What it's going to be like the day the trumpet sounds? It's going to be a day of no return. You don't get do-overs. There's no such place as purgatory. It's a one-time shot. That's it. Once. And if I miss <laughs> the first load, I ain't going to make it through the next seven years. If I can't serve God by grace now, Listen to me. I'm so afraid 
of how many people are just not going to make heaven who are sitting right in church. Come on. Where are you today? There is no such thing as one saved, always saved. None. We can backslide and fall right away from God while sitting in the pews of church. I can know scripture backwards and frontwards. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> and still not put it into practice. And miss God completely. Not just after the trumpet, but in between. <laughs> Before that, I don't want to miss what God has created me for. I don't want to stand before God and realize I wasted my entire life on religious things rather than pleasing him. I don't know if it's going to be like this, but I, I want to be in a position that when I go into the portals of heaven, Jesus said, here he comes. That's my boy. Yeah. He passed over that Christian assembly. Yeah, he's a little crazy, but he was faithful. Amen. He wasn't perfect, but he would, but he trusted me in my grace. He trusted me by faith. Look at look at the crowns he's wearing. Hey. Look at look at all the things he's done for me. To God be the glory. And on that day, I want to have many crowns to produce to Jesus and lay it at his feet and honor him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hey, I don't want to have no ashes and stubble to lay at the feet of my great king and said, This is all I could do. And he's going to look and say, well, I see a pile of nothing. That's the reality. But the greater reality are the souls who are going to miss Jesus because I was too lazy to be a Christian and to be what God called me to do. Making, making, making the salvation of none effect. And I think I'm all right with God. I don't ever want to be in that position. So how do I stop it? Now, the decisions I make today is what determines what happens then. Our steps that we take today, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. It means a good woman too. Or ordered by the Lord. I don't want to miss the steps that he's taken, that he's made for me to do. I want to do everything that God's called me to do. I heard something very simple, and I'm going to close with this for the fifth time. Again, Dr. David Jeremiah, I love his, his messages he's been preaching. He's been, been talking to me. And he was preaching on this. He said, make your salvation that one thing. Make what God has called you to do that one thing, and then make that one thing your main thing. That it had the highest priority in your life. And he gave the example of having that one thing, and he gave the example of Luciano Pavarotti. Have you ever heard of him? One of the greatest opera voices in the whole world in our day. But coming up, he could sing, but coming up, it wasn't determined yet he was going to be an operatic singer. Even though he sang for his family and so forth, he, he's deciding whether he wants to be either a music teacher or a singer. And his dad says, what is in your heart to do the most? What's your greatest desire? He said, do that. But let that one thing be your main thing. He said, you can't sit in two chairs. You got to pick one. And the church is trying to sit in two chairs. The Bible calls it double-minded, where our loyalties are divided between the world and between God. And we got to become singleness of mind again, a singleness of mind and make salvation my main thing and let that one thing be my main thing <laughs> and then push with God with all our minds look it takes a real man or a real woman of God to serve God when nobody else is looking when nobody else is around that proves our Christianity or not what we're doing here is important very important but what we do outside of this is all the more important. You know, this church rises or falls depending on us. And God's will is either done here depending on us. I want to be used to God. I want that one thing to be my main thing. Are you with me today? Let's close out part two today.
by just submitting to God today. And if there's some repentance that needs to happen, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to be praying. We're going to be dismissed. No altar call. I'm even going to sit down a little bit because my knees are tired today. Will we rest in God's word today or not? You know, when the Lord gives us commands, it's a hard thing sometimes. But when we receive the commands he gives, it's good for us. Today, when you do like Jesus, have a Garden of Gethsemane experience this morning before we leave here and decide whether we're going to do God's will for our lives or if we're going to just take it all back because it's too hard or because we may not like what he's chosen for us to do or what he's chosen for us to be as a child of God. It's in those hard times when we surrender our will to God is where it counts the most. How many of you are with me? You know, when I stand before God and as a pastor of this church, one of the things I will have to answer for is what have I done with the calling as pastor of Christian Assembly? Did I honor the pastors before me on the things that were built by their hearts and souls? Or have I done something that is not proper with God? We're going to give an account for our works, saved or not. I want the Lord to be pleased with me. Heavenly Father, search my heart today. Father, where I might be lacking, Father God, in my personal walk with you, I pray that you would reveal it to me, that I may willfully surrender and repent. Father, not necessarily for something I've done, but maybe for the areas in my life that I've been neglecting when it comes to my salvation, when it comes to doing what you've called me to do for this for the sake of others help me today to be everything that you created me to be and everything you desire for me lord your word says that you would give me the desires of my heart lord i open my heart up to receive your desires today and i lay my own wants and my desires at your feet lord i lay my will at your feet not my will, Lord, but thine be done today. Lord, in these days and times, Father, where we don't understand everything, I give you my faith. I give you my willingness. I give you my heart. I give you the talents that you have given me to be used of you. I surrender fully everything today. For, Lord, there's a soul out there that's depending on me to walk right with you. Help me to understand that as I leave here today. To be mindful that wherever I go, I need to be what you've called me to be. I love you. And I thank you today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.